Hi, friends, and welcome to another Searching for Answers session, the program where we dig into the Word of God and let it dig into our hearts. So we're glad you're with us. Participants this evening are, most of all, most importantly, you. You are the one who matters most. We're glad that you are with us. As we roll up our sleeves and dig into an Old Testament work now, the, prophets, the work of the prophet Amos, we uh, have as our participants in front of the lens, Dr. Bernard Taylor, Old Testament specialist, Dr. Leo Ranselin, New Testament specialist at Loma Linda University. My name is John Jones at La Sierra University, and we are just getting into this fascinating book from from 2,700 years and mm. more ago. Yeah. And yet we're already finding that it grabs us. It grabs our attention mm. with, the, with the, the opening <clears throat> words. So if you have your Bible, turn to those 12 little prophets at the end of the Old Testament. Find Amos and get into him with us. Um, if your Bible has maps in the back, find a map of... Uh, Israel and Judea. Um, there will probably be several from representing different time periods. Keep your thumb in there because we will reference geography a time or two along the way. If uh, failing that, uh, you might like to go online and call up uh, on your map the modern uh, maps, Google Maps of Israel and, uh, and uh, use that as a reference point as well. So, Amos, um, uh, a person perhaps of somewhat, perhaps somewhat humble background, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that he is illiterate. He has the ability to really craft the message. He's speaking on behalf of God, but the process of inspiration always gave the prophet some latitude in the choice of the expression. And so he's doing that. We looked last time, we just got into it, chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2. Verse 1, the words of Amos, shepherd, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, but he uh, uh, is uh, alerting us that the important thing is not Amos, but the important thing is the Lord. And uh, uh, Dr. Taylor has noted for us that the grammar in Hebrew uh, the syntax, actually, mm -hmm. usually opens up with the verb and emphasizes that first. The subject usually follows the word, the verb, and then uh, direct and indirect objects. But here, it in Hebrew, goes as our English does. The Lord roars right. yeah, from Zion, which is a way of saying... It's the Lord and not someone else who is doing this thing. We will see parallels to that when we get to chapter 2. And if you want to just flip over for a moment, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 and 11, <clears throat> there also we have the same Hebrew treatment of the syntax. Uh, I destroyed the Amorite, verse 9. Uh, again, God puts his name first. We would translate it if we wanted to really... Uh, represent that emphasis, it was I and not someone else who destroyed the Amorite. It was I who destroyed his fruit above. It was I who raised up some of your children and so forth. Uh, it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Um, so <clears throat> there are places here where God through Amos wants to say, hey people, it's me talking and not someone else. Listen up. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> and so here, this graphic language, chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord roars from Zion, and we have reference again to roaring as a lion as we go through uh, the, uh, the next couple chapters. What does he roar? Well, it turns out that these are oracles uh, against the various nations, perhaps maybe starting off with those uh, most distant and moving progressively geographically closer mm -hmm. to Judah and, and ultimately to Israel. So as you f flip through this in chapter 1, verse 3, uh, it is Damascus 
who comes in for some special attention from God, right? And then look at verse 6. It is, it is Gaza. <clears throat> verse 9, it's Tyre. Mm -hmm. Then verse 11, Edom, the Edomites. Verse 13, Ammon or Ammon, uh, Ammonites. Chapter 2, verse 1, Moab, the Moabites. Now we're, now we're zeroing in on the center of this progressive target, right? Uh, chapter 2, verse 4, Judah, yeah, which is the southern part of the, of the Hebrew uh, settlement area. And finally, 6, uh, verse 6 and following is Israel. Now, each of these civilizations, each of these tribal groups gets three or four verses along the way. But when we come to Israel, <coughs> now Amos focuses in and dwells on Israel right on through chapters 2 and 3 all the way um, because that's really where his focus is going. So he can have a word or two uh, for some of these other surrounding nations, but really it's Israel, the northern half of the Hebrew settlement area that he is after. And he has some rather stringent things to say yeah. in the name of the Lord. So we will just take these little chunks. Maybe let's do Damascus. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Ranselin, you want to you want to take us through verses three, four, five? Sure. Uh, the Damascus section. Just one quick thing, if I could add to what you sure. just said in terms of intro here. There's this formula yeah. for three transgressions and for four, yeah. I will not revoke punishment. And that occurs to for six of the foreign nations and then for two of the nations of, of Yahweh, Judah and Israel. Yeah. So most uh, scholars, I believe, view this as a unit, uh -huh. uh, these uh -huh. eight oracles yeah. of, of judgment. Six against the foreign nations and then Judah. And then, as you yeah. say, he starts uh, really going after <laughs> Israel later on. So, so you've got this ritual formula, this repetition, yes. don't you? Yeah. And perhaps we should say something about that because it occurs eight times. Uh, yeah. uh, it seems to me what Amos is saying, you guys have demonstrated beyond <laughs> yeah. all evidence. You've, yeah. you've done more than enough sinning yeah. and criminal activity to yeah. warrant Yahweh stepping in yeah. Yeah. to judge and rectify yeah. the situation. Three, even four. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. okay. So start with... Syria, Aram, Damascus, yeah. right? So here we go, verse 3. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire on the house of Hazael and it shall devour the strongholds of <coughs> Ben-Hadad. I will break the gate bars of Damascus mm. and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden and the people of Aram shall go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord. A bunch of negatives. <laughs> Breaking uh, down their gates, cutting off the inhabitants, yeah. you know, devouring the strongholds. Right. Yeah. Um, the th motif of fire is going to emerge again and again right. as we continue through all of this. So God is not only a roaring lion, he is um, an avenging or punishing divinity who mm -hmm. is in charge of the fire department, <laughs> not of putting it out, but of, <laughs> but of kindling. Right. right. So we have an indictment here that... Uh, this region that was um, yeah. hotly fought over through the centuries, Gilead, um, is a place in which the Syrians, perhaps in trying to obtain that territory, committed this atrocity of using these, imp these instruments of sledges with iron teeth to just cut down people in a very uh, harsh, cruel, and inhumane fashion. And seems to me that's the indictment that Amos is putting upon the, uh, the Syrians here. And the consequence of that, as you alluded to, the, is this punishment that involves fire in which their security, their strongholds, perhaps their military might 
is brought down uh, and destroyed. We use big combines today in the Midwest to, to harvest corn and other crops. Mm. It's, it's not a process of the individual plant and the individual ear of corn. Right. Yeah. It is a, and, <laughs> Mowed and, down. Right, and that's kind yeah. of the picture we've got yeah. here, isn't Very it? Very graphic. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Um, Bernard, what do you think? Yeah, there, there are um, a few things, if I may. Again, if you're following in a modern English uh, translation, you will have noticed that the book of Amos, chapter 1, uh, verses, uh, verse 1, is a time-setting, um, used to set the time at, at which this occurred. Yeah. And then we move into poetry. Now, Hebrew poetry is different from our poetry because you say it once, you say it again. Uh -huh. the, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, Zion and Jerusalem mm -hmm. are the same, and, yeah. and uh, a good place to see this, if you want to go and take a look, is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Mm -hmm. And some of this is what we call chiastic, because what is our letter X has the name chi in Greek, and it's chiastic. Mm -hmm. So, A, B, uh, and then B, A, and so it gets reversed. And in some cases, it is not chiastic. It's not reversed. Yes. It's A, B, A, B. And that's, yeah, what, and yes. that's what we've mm -hmm. done here. And, um, <coughs> and sometimes it's antithetical. You say the yes. opposite. Mm -hmm. And um, secondly, this is written to be heard. This is... Um, I remember when I was when I was seven and we were living in New Zealand and, and somebody gave us this. This is the house that Jack built. And it was quite long and it was uh -huh. it was monotonous. They just went over it and over it and over it. Adding and over one it. phrase <laughs> each time. <laughs> so this this is designed, carefully written, yeah. to be able to be retained, to hear it. And of course people were were uh, used to hearing and remembering, that was all they had. They didn't, uh, they didn't have three by five pieces of uh, vellum to write on with a quill or anything uh, like that. And next, out of the blue, as best we can tell, Amos recognizes, or those with Amos, his disciples or whoever recorded this, realized that something significant was happening. And in the ninth, eighth century, an agrarian economy turned literary. And they began to record. It was uh, for their posterity, uh, for, so their children could hear it and, and hear what the, the prophets had to say. And so, and then beyond that, we are listening to the identification of the God of Israel with the consciousness outside of the boundaries of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Now, we look to a much later period of time often to see that happening, but here Amos realizes that his God, first of all, he's alive, secondly, he is aware of and here, involved in the politics of other places. And I don't believe, and there's no indication here anywhere, that these people ever heard this. Mm -hmm. This is his rhetorical, oratorical device mm -hmm. to be able to draw upon the surrounding nations. This is what God says. This is what Yahweh says about, about this nation and that nation. And these are the things that are happening. And uh, my professors pictured the crowd standing there getting more involved and say, yeah, yeah, right, you know. And, and, and it draws you in and then you have Judah mm -hmm. and then you have Israel mm -hmm. and it's the longest of all of these. And we call them oracles. An oracle is a divine utterance, mm -hmm. a message mm -hmm. from God. Mm -hmm. And so... That's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Poetry, 
in a context, in a geographical awareness mm -hmm. that says there are common problems here and some are unique and Israel has its own unique problems that have arisen because of the, the historical and geographical events that we described last time with Assyria and Syria and uh, so on. So all of this is going on and it was recorded. Mm -hmm. It has been retained. Yeah. A lot of thought into presenting it, a lot of thought into preserving it. Yeah. That's what lends credence to some folks to say that Amos could not have been this poor, uneducated shepherd uh -huh, and uh -huh, farmer uh -huh. because of the beauty of the poetry right. and the language. Yeah. But uh, it, it's difficult to say. You know, what's also interesting, we've noted the words of Amos concerning what you saw about Israel. Yeah. And so I, I imagine, as you say, an audience perhaps in Samaria or at the sanctuary in Bethel, and the Israelites are saying, yeah, let's start with the foreign nations that have troubled us so Yahweh is going to judge them and protect us and perhaps bring salvation to us. So maybe he's setting up what some scholars argue is a trap to oh, I think where so. he's oh, going yeah. to reshape and reconfigure oh, yeah. that motif of, of Yahweh judging the nations, bringing salvation to Israel. Yeah. He's, he's starting that way, but as we both, know, as all of us know, he's going to reshape that, reconfigure it to in a very yeah. different way <laughs> later on. Many of our the, viewers will, uh, re will recognize the corollary with the Apostle Paul and his discursive strategy right. in Romans. Paul begins in what we call chapter one of mm -hmm. Romans doing the same thing. Right. Look at those wicked Gentiles. Yeah. Look how awful they are. And getting Good the point. amens going when then uh, <laughs> all of a sudden with what we call chapter two, Therefore, whoever you are, mm -hmm. oh man, you have no right to pass judgment because you are as bad or worse. Good point. Yeah. I think that's um, a highly uh, polished approach mm. to getting people's attention, yeah. getting them aligned with you. Yeah. But, but there, is a, there is a trap in that that's waiting to be sprung, isn't there? Yeah. So we will... We will uh, we will hear the amens. The amens now among the, his right. Hebraic hearers <clears throat> have to do with the terrible way that other nations have treated these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, we, We're the chosen people, and look what, what the people of Gaza and Tyre and, and Moab have done. Yeah, um, But that's not really what Amos' aim is. Mm -hmm. He's... He's headed somewhere with this, exactly. isn't he? Yeah. So, okay. So, taking these then, for three transgressions, yea, for four. Huh? Mm -hmm. Damascus, next is Gaza. Um, Bernard, help us with verses 6, 7, and 8. All right. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they carried into exile entire communities mm. to hand them over to Edom. Mm. I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, fire that shall devour its strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. And we can hear the amens. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Mm. Take it to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Now, as you can hear... Amos has in his typewriter a template. Yes. And all he has to do is yeah. fill in in between, yeah. put in the name of the, the place and say something about it. And, and there's some, yeah. this is a green, uh, some things are recycled and yeah. they're, they're set again. It's that formulaic, but it is different every time. Yeah. I, I suspect that the transgressions are well chosen, specific yes. to the targeted group. Yes. Now, the opening that uh, Dr. Ranzelin pointed out um, is, is repeated so many times. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to it in Hebrew. Al shilasha pishe damesek va'al lo ashi venu. 
And if you were a child and you ever got it, you're going to get it. That's what the threat here is. I will not cause it to return. What's it? And each time, lo ashivenu, lo is not. Not I will return it. Mm -hmm. The verb is a complete sentence. It has a subject and a verb and a direct object. One word, mm. ashivenu. Now we negate it with the lo, lo ashivenu. And this sounds every time. I will not cause it to return. Now the, uh, it says here, I will not, uh, in the um, New Revised Standard, I will not revoke it. Mm. And that's the force of it. Mm. Um, but Hebrew doesn't multiply words. It, it takes what it has and it makes adjustments. And, and so the vocabulary is, uh, is shorter. And here, again, threshing sleds of iron last time. And here we have entire communities. Mm -hmm. And if you're listening carefully you'll begin to recognize that the core issue has to do with war. Yeah. And God is concerned about their failure to follow the Geneva Convention, <laughs> mm -hmm. to put it in a modern term. So these people know better. Mm -hmm. Now, in, again, in, in Romans 1, uh, or is it uh, 2, it talks about the conscience. Yes. Mm -hmm. And here's the appeal to conscience. Yeah. You all know better. Mm -hmm. There are agreed standards mm -hmm. and you are not following the rules. Yeah. At the same time, the God of the Old Testament is meeting these people where they are. Mm -hmm. Now, why doesn't he shorten the process and say, stop fighting? Mm. Maybe it's because the Middle East, I don't know. Mm. But... He doesn't say that. He gives them an ethical concern that he has about what they are doing. And it is an opportunity, <coughs> as Israel is listening, yeah. to hear where this might be going and what might be said about them when we get down to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Um here it becomes a question of uh, always fire. Fire is often a part of attack, of warfare. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were not faithful, they get fire. And if, if I may just add uh, verses 9 and 10, now God's attention is turned to uh, Tyre. Mm -hmm. For three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not uh, revoke the punishment to take our New Revised Standard translation. And uh, they delivered entire communities over to Edom, Edom, and did not remember the covenant of kinship. Mm -hmm. And that, again, means that they broke some kind of a, of a treaty or mm -hmm. an understanding, some kind of a, a convention, if you please. They deliberately violated that. Therefore, I will send fire on the wall of Tyre. It will destroy, that will de devour its strongholds. So, um, yeah, there are ethics lurking beneath the surface, not far beneath the surface, mm -hmm. really, that uh, are at play here. Yeah. Um, anything else on 9 and 10? Well, let's, let's make sure to note with both uh, Philistia and Phoenicia here, the issue yeah. that uh, Yahweh is deeply concerned about is slave traffic with Edom. Interesting. Yes, yes, that's right. And it that's makes right. me, you know, I look here at Edom on a map, and the, the king's highway went right through Edom, you know. So yes. perhaps they took advantage of, yeah. of that uh, major trade route going through their country and engaged in these kinds of yeah. inhumane activities with uh, uh, the surrounding nations. Yes. Um, and handing them over to Edom in, uh, in verse 6, as you say, and in verse 9. Right. Now, let's talk about Edom, <laughs> right. finally. So we come to 11. Uh, help us with that, if you will, 11 and 12. Need to read it? Uh, Leo. Okay. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. Yeah. He maintained his anger perpetually 
and kept his wrath forever. And so I will send a fire on Teman, and it shall devour the strongholds of Basra. You, so it's not, now uh, some many centuries later, um, St. Augustine comes up with his rules in the name of Christianity mm. for what is a just and appropriate war and excludes many kinds that are not. Mm -hmm. And also, how do you conduct such warfare mm -hmm. if it is uh, appropriate? Um, obviously, this is a human effort yeah. to, to sort of uh, bring in some divine principles. But nonetheless, one of them is when your enemy stops fighting, you must stop fighting. Mm -hmm. And here the problem is in verses 11 and 12, yeah. uh, Edom did not stop fighting. Right. You know, he maintained his anger. He kept his wrath forever. Here's the parallelism that you mentioned. Mm. You know? um, and so, again, they will get fire. And we need to uh, highlight the fact we're talking about Jacob and Esau and the nations oh, that yeah. flowed out of these twin yeah. brothers. Yeah. Jacob, of course, Israel comes from. And yeah. uh, Esau, Edom. And unfortunately, there's... Hostility between the brothers continues well, here and gets highlighted this relentless fury and anger yeah. and hostility yeah. that the Edomites showed the Israelites mm -hmm. gets highlighted here. Yeah, so oh. we see the pattern. That's, <laughs> right. The, uh, the cadence, uh, the, the, the pace quickens, doesn't it? Um, we will continue next time with the Ammonites and the Moabites and kind of fill in the picture a little bit and then we'll bring it home to Judah and ultimately to mm -hmm. Israel as well. The question, of course, is that war always brings out the worst in us yeah. and squelches back what Abraham Lincoln called uh, our sense of allegiance to our better angels. Mm -hmm. And the question that, that hovers over all of this is, uh, does God hold us accountable even under the extreme conditions that characterize ancient or modern warfare, uh, does God hold us accountable for how we conduct ourselves in combat mm. in that way? It's a retrospective picture. God is looking back at what these people have done and is looking forward as to what God is going to do. Yeah. I will. They did, I shall. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's that mm. constant uh, tick talk back and forth between the two. We will find ourselves asking thoughtful questions as we go on through this now as to which of these prophecies yet remain to be fulfilled? How are we to read this? These are questions that lurk behind the text as we ask ourselves what did it mean in order to determine the value of what does it mean in our time and terms and condition today. Prophecy always asks us to read back and forth mm -hmm. in order to understand. And so we'll pick up this line of thought then as we continue next time on Searching for Answers.